Uh, and thanks for the organizers for organizing this great uh, workshop. I've uh, spending lots of fun things to think about this week, and uh, I've kind of been neglecting my own talk <laughs> because there's so many interesting things to to think about. Uh, so it's going to be kind of an elementary thing, hopefully not too elementary, but uh, uh, let me just tell you how it came about. We were working on the random tilings, random tilings uh, with Cosmin, by the way, this is joint work with my, with a postdoc, Cosmin Pohata at Yale. Uh, we were working on random tilings and uh, then I, I give a talk about the random tiling model and uh, uh, in particular, this is multinomial random tiling model, which I'll mention later on. Uh, and then there was a physicist in the audience, I forgot who it was, but he said, why don't you try to do the same thing for the Ising model? And so, uh, somewhat simultaneously, I got an invitation to come here to the 100 years of the Ising model. So then, uh, this is what came out. Uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions. I, I'm sure you won't be shy. I'm a little bit uh, uh, shy about this talk because I don't feel like it's... No, certainly not as sophisticated as most of the other talks that we've heard recently. Oh boy, uh, how am I going to do this? Oh yeah, so uh, just for some definitions, uh, I've got a finite graph G, and I'm going to define a general quite. This is a. I want to generalize sort of all of Statmec at the same time. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me just start start with an M spin model, right? So I've got M colors, uh, my configuration space. Is the I have to figure out which one is the pointer, right? So I've got the uh, the configurations are just uh, colorings of the vertices with m different colors, or if you like spins, and I've got a general interaction matrix, m by m interaction matrix, positive, uh, just not positive necessarily, but just real numbers. Theta is the inverse temperature. There's the Hamiltonian. It's just a uh, sum over the. It's just a nearest neighbor model. And then the, you know, the contribution from a pair of spins is just the corresponding entry in the matrix. And since I was giving this talk to non-physicists, uh, I, I just threw out both minus signs. Okay, so the, any questions about the model? Nearest neighbor, but like I said, it doesn't have to be nearest neighbor. You can generalize this uh, however you like. So how do I get to the next slide? Okay. Of course, the, the, okay, fine. If you can't read, just let me know. Uh, the POS model is, of course, the interaction matrix is just a multiple of the, of the identity matrix, J times the identity matrix. If we're talking about the IZ model, it's just a two by two, that's just two colors, all right? Everything else, I think, is clear. Uh, now, here's the trick, here's a very simple trick. Uh, I'm going to, you know, blow up my graph, right? So my, here's my original graph G. I'm gonna make a new graph G sub N, where N is some large integer. Uh, and I'm just going to take the vertices, multiply by n, right? So I've got n, replace each vertex with n copies of the vertices, and for each for each edge, for each edge downstairs, I'm going to put this just a complete bipartite graph. Okay, very simple. Uh, okay, and and uh, let's just let me just stick for the time being for the Ising model. It's already interesting enough. Uh, that's the one we care about. Uh, so the multinomial easing model is just going to be the easing model on this blown up graph. Question. Yes. There are other couplings uh, between the spins on the same vertex? There's no coupling. These are not adjacent. Above, above each vertex, they're not, there's no adjacencies. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's the, so it's just, the, uh, now I'm just going to take the Ising model on this new graph G sub N, and I'm going to replace the, and the interaction strength is going to be divided by N. All right, so here's, so of course, uh, this graph has lots of symmetries because above each, uh, the fiber over every point, I can, I can move those points around. So really I don't, if I, the, my, I don't care about the, lo the individual locations of the spins above each vertex, I just care about how many are plus and how many are minus. So I'm gonna record that when, when I, I'm computing the partition function here, right? I'm gonna record just the number of plus spins over each vertex. And let's call that variable k sub v. Right, so the, 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 I get the partition function by summing over all choices of k sub v, which are integers running from zero to n, and that represents the number of plus spins over each vertex downstairs. All right, then I get, uh, 
some, and of course the energy here, uh, the Hamiltonian only depends on the k's, doesn't depend on the individual locations of the, the spins because of the symmetry. So, so when they say symmetry, the, should they think that there is really a global symmetry? No, it's one group with each S yeah, yeah. N? Over each vertex, over each vertex, there's a symmetric group action. Yeah, but when it's and the, there's a symmetric group action over a, a product of symmetric groups, one over each vertex. Right, that's the way the graph is constructed, right? Because there's a complete bipartite graph here, so that uh, you know, no matter how I, I, I rearrange the vertices here, I, I get the same graph. Okay, and then of course, uh, if if I know once I know k, the number of spins over each vertex, the the number of ways to distribute them upstairs is just n choose k. So I get also this this uh, uh, combinatorial factor in the Hamiltonian. Right, and so since we're talking about the Ising model, what is the Hamiltonian? Uh, well, in terms of the case, you know, every time, if I just count the number of plus spins here and the number of plus spins at an adjacent vertex, I get a contribution for their product and a contribution for the, so this is the product of the number of plus spins at one vertex and the number of plus spins at the adjacent vertex, and same thing for the minus spins. So anyway, the, the Hamiltonian is just some quadratic function of the case in the end. It's very simple. Is J in general symmetric? Uh, I, I just decided to stick with the Ising model where J is just a, oh, a constant. But uh, it's not hard to do the other models uh, if you want. Okay. Now, uh, of course, we're going to be interested in large N. We're going to fix the, gr the, the, the initial graph, the downstairs graph, and we're going to let N get large. And uh, let's let alpha v be the fraction of spins over a given vertex, which are plus. Right, so I might as well just record the fraction, which is some number between 0 and 1, alpha v. And then, of course, the binomial coefficient, which we saw, is just uh, becomes e to the n times the entropy, the Shannon entropy. Uh, and so our partition function now can be written as a sum. For a fixed n, it can be written as a sum over the alphas, these fractions, which are multiples of 1 over n. Uh, of x of some expression, and here's the expression we saw before. It's just n times, and then I've got the entropy term coming from the binomial coefficients, the Shannon entropy, plus this quadratic term, which is the interaction strength, sum over nearest neighbors of some interaction, quadratic interaction. And now you see this is kind of a, a kind of a big deal because the, the this term in the exponent is n times something which is independent of n. It's just a continuous function of the alphas. It's 2D problem or 3D? There's no, there's no, uh, we're not in any dimension. It's on any graph. On any so far on any graph. Right, there was no, no constraint on the, down, on the initial long graph range, G. Long range links? Uh, I, I took nearest neighbor for now, but do you, it's not hard to generalize to arbitrary. If you, you, you take the nearest neighbor. neighbor. Yeah. Uh, in the current, uh, right, in what I've presented, I'm presenting it nearest neighbor because otherwise this, this expression will be a little bit more complicated. But uh, nearest neighbor for now. Interaction just on the edge. Interaction only on the edges of the graph. But since the graph is arbitrary, you can, you know, uh, <laughs> you might as well make it the nearest neighbor, but then the graph can be the complete graph. But uh, I should not think it's also like large and limit and top limit for matrix models. It's similar to because mm -hmm. n times trace <clears> for the number of metrics and n goes to infinity again, get classical problem. It is, it's, 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 yeah, it's a similar kind of limit. But, uh, right, so here's an expression for z, z, z the, the, the partition function, right? It's an exponent of n times some function which is a continuous function of the variables you're summing over. Now what happens as n goes, yeah? So alpha is still discrete at this moment. Alpha is still, still discrete over this moment, right? So there's a, uh, there's a but, but nonetheless, this, this, this quantity f of alpha in here is, a, you know, if you think of alpha as varying over zero, one, it's a continuous function, and in fact, a smooth function of those guys, uh, analytic function. And uh, if we want to take the limit now as capital N gets large, right, we're, gonna, we're, trying to, we're interested in the sort of the free energy log, log Z divided by N, N goes to infinity. Then, of course, you know, uh, this N is the important thing. Uh, 
as n gets large, this, this exponent is going to concentrate, this sum is going to concentrate on the maxima of that function f. Right, so eh, that's, what the, that's what the box is. So the, so the point of, you know, in order to compute the free energy here, all we need to do is find the maxima of f. And so what, what's the magic of this, uh, you know, multiplication process is that we've turned the, this annoying summation problem, this impossible to do summation problem, into a simple maximization problem. Right, so, so yay, calculus. Now we can do calculus, multi-variable calculus. Uh, but, you know, we get more. Uh, we, we're not just interested in the free energy, of course, we're interested in the, you know, fluctuations around the, around the typical behavior. And, uh, what, but you can, you can also analyze the fluctuations in, very, in a very similar way, right? Because uh, when n is large, Almost all the mass of this, you know, when you normalize to make this a probability distribution, almost all the mass is located near the maximum. And in fact, the behavior is governed, well, that's what I'm right, explaining here. The fluctuations in the alpha vectors are governed by the shape of f near its maximum. Uh, almost all the mass hap is happening in a, in, a, in a neighborhood of the maximum or maxima of this function f. And generically, if we're lucky, if we're not unlucky, I should say, the Hessian of f at the maximum is a negative definite, you know, and, uh, matrix, and that means that the, the fluctuations, uh, the actual values of the spins, the, the fractional spins, are just a, a Gaussian field, some multidimensional Gaussian with a covariance determined by the inverse of the Hessian, right, the, the, the quadratic approximation to f near its maximum. So we get this Gaussian, in some sense, Gaussian behavior for free uh, just from the, from the expression of this type. But uh, that, that depends on this Hessian being, uh, you know, non-degenerate, negative definite near the maximum. And in fact, that doesn't always happen. Uh, but uh, so let's, let's, let me prove a few small things about this behavior. Uh, any questions? Well, uh, okay, so here's the first uh, 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 kind of easy thing to prove, is that when the interaction is small, either small positive or small negative, then f has a unique non-degenerate maximum, and it happens when the, the alpha, remember alpha is the fraction of spins which are plus, so exactly half plus and half minus, that's, that's where it maximizes. And, that, and essentially the entropy, entropy wins, when that's the rule, that's the, you know, uh, conclusion, the expected conclusion is that when you have small interaction, entropy wins. And here's the proof, just a couple lines. If I write alpha as a half plus x, so x is the deviation from a half, here's a plot of the entropy function, the Shannon entropy function, right, maximized at a half, which it, where it has maximum log 2. But in fact, for small x, the, you know, the, the next term in the expansion is minus 2x squared, and then there's this error, which is in fact negative. So S of S of one half plus X is always strictly less than, I mean, less than or equal to this thing and only equal to at, at X equals zero. So when you plug that in, so here's the expression that I'm, that I'm, that I'm trying to maximize here. S, the S is, and, and both terms are maximized. When J is small, S is maximized at uh, alpha equal a half. And this one is just adding a small quadratic uh, change to that. So in fact, the f, when you expand near small x, you just get some constant, and then you get this interesting uh, quadratic piece to the expansion, then there's some errors which are negative. And uh, as long as this, this uh, the quadratic, this matrix here, 2 times the identity minus j naught times a, a is the adjacency matrix of the graph, why the adjacency matrix? That comes from this term here, and I just got the nearest neighbor interaction on this graph. Uh, as long as this, this matrix is, non de is a positive definite, then f is actually maximized when x equals 0. Okay, so uh, th this, is, this is going, this, and when is this non degenerate and positive definite? This, this, uh, well, certainly when j naught is sufficiently small, this will be close to the identity and therefore it'll be, you know, positive definite. And in fact, the, the, it, it works all the way through the range, uh, depending on the, the range is just the, depends on the spectrum of the adjacency matrix A. 
So as long as 2 over j naught is not uh, inside the, the spectrum determined, I mean the, the interval of the spectrum of A, then the, you get this uh, non-degeneracy. Question? Yeah. So up to now you had no boundary conditions? Nope, no. it's just a graph. So of, it's, it's in fact, a finite graph. by having one vertex and somehow... Yeah, later on. Something. And this will somehow change the slope of this thing here? Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll introduce some boundary conditions in, in, uh, in a bit. But yeah, got any more questions? So here's, here's the range of possible values of 2 over j. So if you like, uh, I, I, stuck, I, I did the mathematics thing of putting the, the inverse temperature inside the j. So if you like, uh, uh, high temperature is you can be you can be high temperatures out near infinity. So here's here's zero. So everything to the right of zero is a ferromagnet. Uh, everything to the left of zero is anti-ferromagnetic. Man, magnetic. And it, there's actually three three uh, there's four interesting places. There's the there's the top critical point, which is the leading eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. I don't understand the anti-ferro because that depends on whether your graph has frustration. Yes. Right, but the anti. Right, but the, the, the spectrum also depends on the whether the graph has fr frustration as well. Yes, I mean then it could become much more complicated. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> You're one slide ahead of me, also. <laughs> okay, we'll get there. We're two slides ahead of me. So, but the, but so the, the easiest point to analyze. I mean, we analyzed the case when two, when J naught is small, which is which is the shade the region over here and here, that where we have a nice non degenerate. Sing, there's just one, you know, Gibbs measure, and so, but let's 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 talk about this point, the ferromagnetic critical point, first. Then we'll analyze the other regions, which are more interesting. Okay, uh, okay. So what is lambda one? It's the leading eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix of the graph, of the downstairs graph. And so, just for the sake of simplicity for this talk, let's just assume our graph is regular. So that eigenvalue is delta. Delta is the uh, degree of the graph. Then we get some interesting behavior. Then what happens? Well, uh, what happens is that when you look at this expression for, the, for that function f, uh, we find that the Hessian the, at the maximum is no longer uh, non-degenerate. It, it, uh, uh, it's not, no longer just a simple quadratic uh, maximum. It's got one direction, in fact, exactly one direction where the, this, this quadratic piece uh, has a zero eigenvector, eigen, eigenvalue. And what is, that, what is that direction? What's the direction, you know, the all ones, because we, our graph is regular, so all ones vector is in the kernel. This, is, this quadratic piece is just is exactly the, the Laplacian of the, of the graph. You see the Laplacian here, and it's got the kernel, which is the constant functions. So what happens is that the there's there's one direction where the where the Hessian is uh, not quadratic. I mean, the the second derivative is not quadratic. And so in that setting, we have to go back to our entropy function and include the next term in the expansion of the entropy entropy function, which is the the degree four term. Remember the entropy, entropy function, the Shannon entropy, it's just a Shannon entropy. Where was it? Right, right here. It's got this uh, nice quadratic, quadratic part, but then there's one more term. We're going to need to include one more term in there, which is the degree 4 term. It's right there. And so what happens is that the, now it, we look at the total spin, the magnetization of the system. Right here I've got a finite graph. Uh, I look at the sum of the spins. Well, okay, the xvs are the, uh, uh, the sum of the spins minus a half, so the deviation of the spin from a half, uh, and I'm going to multiply that by, the, by n to the one-fourth. Let's call that the quantity y, and then at every vertex, I've got the difference between the, the deviation of the local spin from the mean spin, from the magnetization. And that, I don't know if you can read that, but it's n to the one-half. Anyway, the, the result is that the the, uh, this, this variable y does not have a Gaussian behavior. It's got a sort of a stretched Gaussian behavior, e to the minus uh, y to the fourth. The density is e to the minus y to the fourth. And so the, what you find is that the, you know, the, the 
the, di the distribution of the spin at a vertex looks like n over 2, well, 1 half if you divide by n. And then there's this th end of the 3 quarters uh, behavior, random behavior, which is global. That is, all the, everybody's doing the same uh, end of the 3 quarter, uh, has the end of the 3 quarter contribution. And then it's got a local contribution to, depending on the vertex, which is just a Gauss, standard Gaussian free field. And I tried to indicate that with this uh, sort of schematic. You know, every vertex is, is uh, varying with respect to its neighbors at, at the scale end of the one half, but then the, the whole graph itself has a mean spin, the global spin, which has this sort of end of the three quarters uh, standard deviation, which is non Gaussian. So that's the ferromagnetic critical point where it's, it's almost Gaussian, but there's one direction which is a stretched Gaussian. Uh, well, the other, the other interesting point is the, well, let me go back to the graph. Here, here it is, in fact. Right, the other point is over here at the anti-ferromagnetic critical point, which is always, I mean, the, the other end of the spectrum is always negative. Uh, always less than zero, so that's in the anti-ferromagnetic phase runway somewhere. Uh, what happens there is, is kind of similar, but the difference is that the lowest eigenvalue can have a large multiplicity. It's not just, there's not just one, unlike the Laplacian, the Laplacian has just a one-dimensional kernel if the graph is connected, but for the lowest eigenvalue, you can have essentially an arbitrarily high multiplicity. For example, for the complete graph, if my graph is, if I downstairs graph is the complete graph, then the lowest eigenvalue, which is minus one, has multiplicity n minus one, which means that I get this high dimensional non-Gaussian component to this, uh, to these fluctuations. But it, it, even though it's non-Gaussian, it still has a reasonably simple description in terms of some stretched Gaussian uh, uh, e, to the, e to the x to the fourth behavior. A question for the previous slide. So yeah. I think I understand. I see well why this Gaussian free field appear, but the thing, do you have a natural explanation for the n to the three quarter? Is there a way to understand that? Or? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to tell you? <laughs> well, uh, it's right. So. Uh, the individual spins are kind of constrained to be near each other. But the global, the global spin, I mean, they, they can all move simultaneously. Like they, they can all move slightly positive or slightly negative. The, the, the only effect that they're fighting there is the, is the global entropy. Uh, uh, well, we have a name for that. Oh, yeah? It's the Griffith-Simon trick of generating uh, five, four uh, distributions out of using mm -hmm. spin variables. Is it the same thing? Almost, except that Griffiths uh, set himself the task of generating more general distributions of single spin, including continuous five-fold distributions, uh, through combinations of local spins. The one difference is that he allowed also coupling within the on-site, the, the vertical uh, spins. Mm -hmm. By okay. this coupling, you can cancel. You go to the critical point of the mean field local coupling, yeah. And you cancel the quadratic term in the entropy precisely as in, in yeah. this situation. You, you are left with a phi for variable at each side, which is then coupled as you wish. It the, sounds very similar. Yeah. yeah. Sounds very similar. And that, that played the fundamental role in the analysis of phi for field theory through easing technique. Okay. Okay. Vincent, did, did you understand the explanation? Uh, partly, but uh, at least anyway, that would make but but right, the point is that it, at when you're sitting at the at it's at a very careful interaction strength, you can you can cancel out the quadratic term uh, uh, in the in the Hessian. Anyway, let me go on, and maybe we can talk about it after. Uh, yeah, so I, I, you know I, th that that's the end. <laughs> uh, but basically. Uh, for the anti-ferromagnetic ferromagnetic critical point, you can have a quite large multiplicity, and then, then you get this sort of high-dimensional non-Gaussian component to the, to the fluctuations. But uh, this uh, interesting kind of graph theory problem, which I don't think 
we know how to we know very much about. I asked a couple of graph theorists and they weren't you know didn't really have anything intelligent to say. <laughs> what graphs have the have the lowest eigenvector uh, sorry lowest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix with a large multiplicity? Like like Kn of course is one example. Uh, uh, and another thing you can do is take an odd cycle to uh, a product of a bunch of odd cycles that'll have a large multiplicity. But uh, I, I don't know in, in general if there's some sort of interesting geometric graphs uh, uh, which, which have this property. So bipartite. bipartite doesn't have that, it has multiplicity one. Because bipartite, the lowest multiplicity is one, it's just the opposite of the... <coughs> in the... In the symmetry graph, I would think it comes from symmetry, that it sort of has such a high uh, degeneracy. Yes, certainly. So the symmetry would help. Symmetry helps, but it's not the only thing. Well, I, I, I don't know what, what helps. It's also some type of interaction with some details. Hmm? <coughs> the gen degeneracy is coming also from the type of interaction talking. Oh, that's right. Uh, right. Everything I presented so far is a uh, you know, just for a standard graph where all the interaction strengths are the same, but uh, you can arrange uh, with diff varying the interaction to to make this degeneracy quite presumably quite interesting. But uh, the the question is how to do it in a in a, some sort of geometric setting. I think that would be very interesting to study. Okay. Um, what about the let, let Let me talk now about the low temperature ferromagnets. Ferromagnet. So uh, subcritical. <laughs> yeah, so uh, low temperature, but still still positive interaction. So it wants to be a ferromagnet. Ferro magnet. Then what happens is we get uh, two, as, as expected, we get two states. The, there's a sort of symmetry breaking between that. So we get a plus state and two states, the plus state and the minus state. F, the function F has exactly two maxima, one where one where all the spins are all, all the spins are equal and positive and one where all the spins are equal and negative, just as you might expect. And you know, there's some equation which tells you what the xc values are. Uh, and they, they're always non-degenerate. So it's kind of not as expected and not terribly interesting. Right? And, I'm, I'm not, the, you know, and the proof is just a few lines. It's not very hard, unlike I think in the standard Ising model. And now, uh, but now if you try to go to the low temperature antiferromagnet, which Jörg mentioned, there uh, it's much more difficult. And we don't know anything. And the reason we don't know anything is because it's an NP-hard problem, right? <laughs> if, if you try to set, let j be negative and tend to, you know, minus infinity, then you are approximating the max cut of the graph. If you look at which spins are plus and which spins are minus, that will be an approximation to max cut, which is a known NP-complete problem. In fact, even approximating max cut is an NP-complete problem. So we can't really expect to see, uh, you know, a, a, a very good theory here. And in fact, even for the triangle, it's not obvious what the maxima are, but they, they look like this. One vertex is zero, and then two, vertex, two other vertices are, have opposite spin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, there, there are some, I, I did some fun ex computer experiments in this range, and it's, and it's Quite non-intuitive what happens. Uh, okay, um, but let's move on. Uh, what happens when G has a fixed boundary, right? This is our standard sort of conformal invariant setup or de uh, you know, setup. We have a region in ZD, maybe a nice region with smooth boundary. We put minus boundary conditions on part of it, plus boundary conditions on part of it, and then we're going to ask about what happens inside. And uh, uh, in general, this is still hard in this case, but uh, uh, let's go back to the ferromagnetic, sorry, ferromagnetic critical point. Uh, there's, there's the place where we can hope to have something interesting going on, and indeed something interesting does go on, as uh, long as the, well, here, the spin on the, what does it mean to put plus here? Plus is here, it means, well, of course, each, uh, each site has a fraction of, spins, a fractional spin running from, you know, minus a half to plus a half, if you like, from zero to one, the fraction of plus spins, yeah. Which cri critical temperature of which model? The ferromagnetic critical point 
which is the where 2 over j naught is the leading eigenvalue of the graph. So are you on your this multiplied graph? Okay. Yeah, this is the this is the multiplied graph. So there's so an infinite system. Right? Are you taking n? You, you cannot talk about this system with n infinite. Right? Yes, we can. But your, your interaction would be zero. Right? <laughs> your interaction was j over n. Right? Yes. The interaction is j over n, but the uh, that's the interaction on the level of the individual spins. Right. But the renormalized interaction, when I, the interaction between the right at each vertex, I've got some variable which I call alpha v, alpha u, and alpha v, and there's an interaction in the limit which uh, s survives. It's a finite system. It's a finite system. Yeah. Then what is the physical temperature? So it's finite, but then you can take n to infinity. In the limit that n goes to infinity, so, yeah. there's still... Did you take it or the limit or not yet? I took the limit, yes. Good. Then it is a finite system. Yeah. Yeah. You have finitely many degrees of freedom. There. Yes, exactly. Finite so so what's, what's the critical touch? How you define it? Just I just, I just define it. I just... <laughs> <laughs> you say you are at a critical temperature. What is it? Just the critical temperature is, is right. Uh -huh. Two over j naught equals lambda one. Two over j naught equals lambda one. The leading eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. That's it. Okay. That's it. Right. That uh, remember my remember my range. Right. Uh, lambda one is here. Lambda n is there. If I've got n vertices and I'm sitting at two over j at that point. And you will tell us why you believe it's critical temperature. That's the, this is the point. If I vary this thing above here, there's uh, above here there's one one state. All the all there's one uh, spin. All everybody's got the same spin. Here there's exactly two Gibbs measures where all the spins there's two spins. One which is plus, one which is minus. There's a plus state and a minus state here. There's only one state here. That's why this is critical. Even though it's a finite, even though my graph is finite, uh, you know, secretly there's this infinite, uh, you know, collection of copies in the background. Okay, and uh, right, if the spins on the boundary are positive on this region but small, that is close to a half, and the spins over here are are mostly negative but uh, you know close to close to you know, a half, then the the, then this mean value of the spin inside will be the harmonic extension of the, of the boundary values, as long as we're at that critical point. Why, why is just because from the, you know, this is just from calculus. You, you want to find the maxim, maximum of this function f, and uh, you find that the maximum uh, satisfies a local equation in order for the value at a point to be you know, you, the derivative of f with respect to that function has to be the average of its neighbors. So these boundary conditions are the same for all layers of the end layers. No, no, it was right. So this is my was... on my graph here. I have some some boundary values, yes. and the boundary values are zero, x zero and one. X, x x v's, which are somewhere between zero and one, and I'm taking them all close to a half. I'm going to take it to a half plus some small some small error. Sorry, the alpha v's were a half plus some small small x v's small. And on, on part of the boundary they're small and positive, on another part of the boundary they're small and negative. Any other questions? Yes. Why is it important that it's small? Uh, to because. Uh, uh, Near the boundary, there's some nonlinear effects, mm -hmm. right? If they're large, then the entropy, right? You can't approximate the entropy with just this quadratic term, and you get some degree four effects. And that, that those, I, I, I don't know how far those degree four so effects propagate. Like the bulk spin, so right. The bulk right. So this, this, I didn't write a theorem here because this is, I'm trying to stay vague. That's the seems to be the theme of today, <laughs> is to stay a little bit vague about the exact meaning of this statement. But it's, it's, it's true, and the, you know, the deviation of the spin from its mean value is, in fact, a Gaussian free field, as we, as we saw. All right. 
we did discuss the, the case when they are all plus and very close to one. Yes, if they're you all... Will, you will. No, I wasn't planning on it. Well, I, you see it in the next slide. No, I guess you don't see it in the next slide. But if, but if, the, if the boundary conditions are all plus, then you will converge quickly to the, con, the, to the plus phase, mm -hmm. where, and the plus phase has all the spins are equal to some critical value, the critical value given by... Uh, oh, in this, in, at the critical point, the critical value is zero. The boundaries of all the ones. All ones, and then they will converge to, right? It'll, it'll relax quickly to the, to sort of quadratically quickly to the, to the zero in the middle. You can kind of see that on the next, I don't know, this is kind of small. Maybe I'll blow, try to blow that, this particular picture up here. You can see that? We don't see the line. Where did it go? Okay, down here. Yeah. Yeah. Now. So here I just uh, did a one-dimensional, this is a one-dimensional system, just a, a segment, right? That's kind of a, for the usual easy model, it's kind of boring, but <laughs> for the segment, for this multinomial case, it's kind of interesting. Uh, here's the phase, sort of phase diagram uh, in terms of, so here I'm at the, uh, Low temperature ferromagnet, which means that there's two states. There's a plus state and the minus state. And you can see the you know, minus state here, plus state here. And what I, what did, I, did, what I did was I just took a system uh, with boundary conditions. On, on one side of the boundary, it's plus. I fix a plus value. And on the other side of the boundary, I fix a minus value. This axis is the is I guess the uh, right boundary, and this axis is the, the left boundary. Well, uh, uh, after a sign change, or maybe I got them backwards. It doesn't matter. You can see the boundary conditions on the plot. So, uh, uh, and what happens is that, of course, if, uh, you know, if one of the boundary conditions is, is bigger than the other, the, the other is negative. <laughs> the one on the left, the, the boundary value is higher, it has larger absolute value than the negative boundary value has in absolute value. Then it'll be, then the plus spin wins throughout almost the whole domain. Right, That's, so this, this line is where the two, here on the left is positive, on the right is negative, and they may, but in terms of absolute value, one may be larger than, than the other. And there's something interesting going on over here when uh, there's, there's some sort of critical value where uh, when, you get, when, you get, when both spins get beyond the critical value, they, you get this interesting uh, jump, which floats right in the middle of the, of the plot, which is a Debruchian phase. That's what it looks like to me, at least. <laughs> you know, the system goes, this, it has to get from here to here somehow, and you know, it, it likes to be at either at the, plus state or at the minus state. And, you know, it, it could jump all the way down to the bottom, but it gets stuck in this plus state for a long time, and then somewhere in the middle it goes down, and then it continues along with the minus state there. Here, Rick, is there by any chance this window where it jumps has to do with the three-quarter exponent? Because somehow it's, you're exactly in the rhythm of this law. No, the three-quarter exponent is only at the critical Point. This is not the critical point. This, I'm in the subcritical phase. Sub. This is the low temperature phase. Low temperature phase. Yes. As a function, you said that it was on an interval. Uh, yes. Original graph. As a function of the length of this interval, can you get some estimate uh, about the width? The width doesn't depend on the length of the interval. This is just like a. Final the width only depends on the temperature. Yeah. Okay. So you can imagine the width being, you know, going to infinity, and this 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 phase remains. Yes. It's a bit strange that this jump is localized exactly in the middle of the interval. I mean, there's nothing holding it there. Except, Except that you need to, yes, that's right. This is very mysterious, right? Remember, what, what we're doing is we're maximizing, it's just a calculus exercise. We're maximizing a certain function. And uh, if you try to push this even a tiny bit over to the left, it'll be a tiny bit smaller, 
uh, and therefore, you know, the maximum really wants to be right by the, the symmetric point. In that setting, what is your graph G? No. It's just a segment. A segment. Yes. Is it constant, this function, in between the middle and the end point? Uh, it looks it's constant, constant within small exponenti factor. exponentially small factor. Exponentially small factor. Right, but that exponentially small factor actually plays a role. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, but it's not entirely constant, localized. Yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be localized in the fact it's exponentially close to a constant. It's kind of a weird uh, setting where this exponentially small quantity really pins it down. The and you say exponential in what? In the length of the graph, or yeah, in the in the length of the graph. That's right. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on time? In those pictures, m capital is already infinity or very large? This is a infinity. Let's say if you if you run I know Glauber dynamics for n large but finite, I guess you'll see this boundary moving. Uh, yes, that's right. It'll move a tiny bit, but uh, very. That's an extremely slow, sort of exponentially slow, me metastable. Uh, Right. If I started somewhere over, it's a metastable thing. It takes an infinite, I mean, exponential amount of time to, to equali equilibrate. L let me go on, because... Uh, uh, to answer your question, we've got a little bit more than 15 minutes. 15 minutes, oh, great. Uh, should I go back to, should we stay with the one-page mode here? Oh, no, this, I can't scroll this way. Maybe I can scroll this way. No. <laughs> Down. Okay, so let me. Other stat mech models have this. Can you can play the same game with, right? It was somewhat successful. The IZ model not completely successful, but the. Uh, I won't, let me tell you about the reasonably successful model, which is the random tiling model. All right, and uh, uh, again, it starts with a finite graph, uh, and. I'm going to, I have a set of tiles. What's a tile? It's just a set of vertices. Any set of vertices can be considered a tile, right? And uh, I can still make this graph G sub n, right? My blown up graph. Right, if you want to think of it as a tiling problem, you know, I can take some, you can think of my original graph as some sort of grid, and then maybe my tiles are, you know, L shapes or, or something like that, right? A, a tile is just a subset of the vertices of the graph. But then I'm going to blow up the graph uh, and let omega n, there are going to be tilings of the blown up graph with lifts of the tiles that I'm using downstairs. So what does it mean? That it's essentially I'm, I'm tiling the graph downstairs, but covering each vertex n times. It's like having an n-fold n covering of the graph with my tiles, copies of my tiles. And if you like, I could put some weights on the tiles just to add some parameters into the problem. Uh, so that the any tiling, do, do, you, do you understand what I mean? Tiling of Gn, uh, the, in the lifted graph, every every tile T, which is a tile of the downstairs graph, can be lifted into the upstairs graph in many many possible ways. I just have to pick for each vertex in my tile. I have to pick one of the vertices in the upstairs graph, which which it's 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 being part of. All right. So then uh, omega n is a set of tilings of this graph with lifts of my tiles. Uh, and uh, then I have a weight, right? A weight function, which is just the product of the tile weights. And I got a partition function, which is the sum over all configurations of their weight. Okay. What? A tiling means a complete partition of the vertices? Yes, a partition of the vertices into tiles. So if you, uh, right, my, my, if my graph, suppose my tile, you know, is a set of all dimers, for example, dimer covers downstairs, then a, each dimer down here corresponds to a choice of two, two vertices here. So that's, a, that's one lift of a tile. And all those tiles? All those tiles are allowed. Yes, and, and they have the same weight, right? They all have the same weight, yeah. yeah. So question one, how, how do we compute this one, this uh, partition function here? There's actually a, a nice combinatorial formula, which is that, uh, uh, so now I'm going to, in order to 
explain the combinatorial, I'm going to have to let n vary from vertex to vertex. So rather than have one single value of n per vertex, I have a vector of, of, of over each vertex, I've got some, some number n, which may vary from vertex to vertex. So let me call that n vector, right? And so for each set of n vector, I get some partition function, which is the sum of tilings of that particular graph, and I make it into an exponential generating function. And the theorem is that this exponential gener function has a nice, very simple combinatorial form. It's just the exponent of a single polynomial p. And what is the polynomial p? It's up here. It's a polynomial with n variables, one for each vertex of the downstairs graph. I have to keep, <laughs> have to keep reminding ourselves that there's two graphs. There's the downstairs graph. It's got n vertices, one variable for each vertex. And then for each tile, a tile is a set of vertices. So to each tile is a monomial, which is the product of the, those the variables corresponding to that tile. And it's got some weight. So you just make this polynomial. You exponentiate it, and you get this uh, uh, exponential series of generating functions. And the proof is not really very hard. It's just some fun with multinomial coefficients. But uh, uh, this exponent of p, of course, you can write as sum of p to the k over k factorial. And what does this thing count? This thing counts tilings where you use exactly k tiles. Remember, k tiles in, in order to tile the upstairs graph, right? So. Uh, so, so the reinterpretation, the sort of probabilistic interpretation of this theorem is as follows. Uh, what is p to the k over k? Well, p has one term for each tile. p to the k means do, an, do the following experiment. Put all your tiles in a bag. Put all your tile types in a bag. Pick one out at random with a, with a replacement. Do that k times, and then put those on your graph. Okay, so forget that slide. Let's just go to this slide. Here's, here's the game, right? We've got, a, we've got a graph here. It's a two by three grid. And uh, let, me, let me just take the tiles be the dimers. That is the edges, right? So I've got seven possible tiles. This, this tile, that tile, and so on. So what we've got is a bucket at each, at each vertex of, of uh, capacity n, 100 or something. Now we play the following game. We pick a random edge. There's seven possible edges of this graph. We pick a random edge, and for that edge, we throw one ball in, in, the, in the buckets at its endpoint. Right, that corresponds to placing a tile uh, in the upstairs graph above, this, above these two buckets. So yeah, pick two adjacent buckets, put one ball in each. That's, that, that's the game. Right? And now we're going to repeat until each bucket has exactly n balls. Uh, when the, the, the throwing a ball in a bucket, does that choose one of the n levels or? No. No, you don't care about the levels because those are all uh, equivalent to each other. Okay. Right? There's a symmetry that says doesn't, you, don't have to, you don't have to choose them. Right? The, the magic of the combinatorics says you don't have to choose the, choose the level. You just choose the buckets. But here n is fixed for all buckets? Or? n is fixed for all buckets here. Okay. Just, just for the purpose of this, uh, this is just an, ex an example. And your tiles are just bonds, right? In this example, tiles are just bonds. Yep. Any more questions? It's a very, it's very simple. Going to happen. What? It's not necessarily going to happen. It's not going to happen. That's right. Darn it. <laughs> but we're going to do some rejection sampling. If it doesn't happen, we, we start over. And eventually, we're going to, if we're, we'll get lucky, and every bucket will fill up at exactly the same rate. Right. What it is, of course, is uh, over here. We're doing some random walk in z plus to the sixth. Right. There's six buckets. Each time I throw, I, I pick two buckets and I increase those two coordinates. So it's a random walk in z six, and I want to condition it to end at a particular point. N n n n n. N n n n n n. All right. Uh, uh, of course, if we pick each bucket, if we pick each edge with the same probability one seventh, it's exponentially unlikely to happen. Right? Because the two buckets in the center fill up faster, you know, 50% faster because there's three edges adjacent to them rather than two. So what we need to do is bias, tilt the, tilt the random walk by the giving buckets one, th the, the buckets on the outside, one, three, six, and four, a, a higher weight. That, uh, so we're going to change the distribution on tiles, but it's going to be a gauge transformation 
It's not going to change the underlying probability measure on, con on uh, random walks. And it still will be very unlikely that they will get to the point. And, 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 and. Yeah, but much, sort of only <laughs> polynomially <laughs> unlikely this time rather than exponentially yeah. unlikely. Right. So, but when, what we need to do is, is solve these equations. Uh, so, these, these, I'm going to reweight the buckets with these variables x1 through x6 so that the rate of that which balls enter bucket one is all, and rate of bucket two and so on are all the same. And I chose one third somewhat arbitrarily here. Uh, okay, so those are the equations we need to satisfy, so, sort of fill up so that all the buckets are being filled up at the same rate. And there's a theorem that says, you know, uh, one can, there exists this essentially unique solution, modulo gauge. And once canonical you know. Ensemble. What? It's grand canonical ensemble. Grand canonical ensemble, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, this is some sort of a. You know, if you have a random walk in Rn, uh, you can adjust the exponentially tilt it so it heads toward any particular value as long as that value is inside the convex hull of possible values for your random walk. That's what's going on. And you know, you, you, then you can get the uh, partition function asymptotic, the free energy of the, of the model. I'm, I'm going fast over the details, I apologize, but uh, I want to get to the conclusion. Uh, for, oh, by, by the way, in the example, what you need to do is reweight by the golden ratio, so the outer buckets get the golden ratio. That means that the outer edges are slightly, I mean, th these edges are slightly more lightly. It changes the probability distribution on the edges so that everybody fills up at the same rate. Which is great, but we're, as Senya pointed out, we still need to arrange that all this, that this polynomial factor that they all end up at the same place. And so if we look at the fluctuations of how many times we place each tile, uh, well, uh, of course it's just gonna, the number of times we place each tile is a binomial distribution, which converges to a Gaussian random variable in the limit. But then we need to condition the Gaussian to lie on a particular subspace where all the buckets get filled up at exactly the same time. But uh, that's okay because when you take a multidimensional Gaussian and you restrict it to by this lin lie in this linear subspace, it's still Gaussian. So at the end of the day, we get a Gaussian field for the number of times we use each tile. That's the so the should I read that after placing k tiles, each tile is placed a binomial number of times, just because we're doing essentially coin flips to to place each tile, and it has a certain given mean. For large k, this tends to a Gaussian random variable. We then condition that Gaussian to lie in the subspace. And what subspace is it? It's a subspace which guarantees that we end up at a given, at our given location. All the buckets are filled up at the same time. That's again a Gaussian. So uh, the conditional Gaussian to, uh, is again a Gaussian and with a new covariance structure, a new and interesting covariance structure, uh, which, uh, you know, it's not, so it's not so important what it is. Uh, you can write it down explicitly. <laughs> Why did you snort? <laughs> it's just uh, new and interesting covariance structure, but you're not going to say what it is. Okay, I'll tell you what it is. Okay. <laughs> it's a projection matrix. The, the covariance, so what are these variables? Let me tell you what the variables are. It's the number of times I'm placing each tile. Right? In this case, there are seven possible tiles. I want to know what the probability is. I, I, you know, uh, I know the... I know the expected value of each tile, but the actual number of times I place each tile when n is large is some Gaussian. And it's a Gaussian field. And I've normalized it by dividing my square root of k. I subtract the mean value divided by square root of k. Then the covariance between these variables for two different tiles is a certain projection matrix, given by a certain projection matrix to the kernel of this operator d, which I didn't talk about. D is the adjacency, the incidence matrix between tiles and vertices. In this, in this theory, there's an operator D, which is just the incidence matrix between tiles and vertices. So it's one or zero, depending on whether the vertex is in the tile or not. There's also a tiling Laplacian, which is the, you know, D, D star, when D is this incidence matrix. Uh, okay, so great. Now, uh, let's just get to the pictures. So I got a couple of minutes left. Uh, here's my, uh, I won't do the simplest example, but here's the next simplest example, maybe. I'm going to tile the plane Z2 with copies of the tr L triomino, the polyomino consisting of three vertices, you know, 0, 1, and I. And I'm going to put 
for the purposes of this, <laughs> I'm gonna put a small density of monomers as well. Epsilon, so a monomer has a weight epsilon, uh, otherwise I get a slightly degenerate, uh, then otherwise I have to worry about boundary conditions. And if, if I don't wanna worry about boundary conditions, I can just put in the small density of monomers. Then you can go through the, this uh, linear algebra, really, to compute the covariance matrix between tiles. And by translation and variance, I just need the covariance between a tile at the origin and a tile at s comma t, and it turns out to be this quite interesting kind of uh, Fourier coefficient of uh, a rational function. One over some polynomial, which you can recognize as being constructed from the two, two types of tiles. And when you work that out, this, this uh, Fourier coefficient, has, it's one over, the den denominator here has a zero on the unit torus. Non-trivial zero on the unit torus, which means that something interesting is going on. The, and, you know, there's, there's a Bessel function times some periodic function, cosine 2 pi over 3 times s minus t. The, the, here, 0, 0 is, at, here, these are points in Z2, the covariance of two, tile, two, two of these L-type tiles, one at the origin and one sort of at s comma t. And what you see is that, you know, when epsilon is quite small, you see this sort of periodic structure appearing, which sort of decays with distance away from the origin. Right? I put one tile at the origin, and then the, 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 here the orange means positive correlation covariance, and blue means negative covariance. So I put a tile at the origin, and then these tiles around it are suppressed, except along this diagonal. And then th two, three diagonals away, they're also, uh, what's the opposite of suppressed? In the, in the second fold of the system, where epsilon is, is there epsilon? There's this one. No, no, no second formula. In the second formula, down here, there's log of one over epsilon. There's an epsilon inside the square root. This is a Bessel function which you know decays but has a logarithmic, uh, so it decays with distance. And as epsilon goes to zero, you you see this sort of kind of crystallization procedure where you know you put a tile at the origin and then tiles sort of arbitrarily far away are are have are pos are you know exactly you know perfectly correlated with it. So even though, you know, there's, th th this is just talking about the fluctuation away from the mean value, that the mean value is some huge number, n is going to infinity, and then there's some fluctuations, but the fluctuations are per perfectly correlated in this epsilon goes to zero. And, and the underlying graph can be thought as a torus? And, uh, yeah, you could take it on a torus, it's a, it's, but you know, it makes sense to take a limit uh, on Z2. This is on Z2. Right? You first take a limit. Yes, that's important. First take the capital N goes to infinity limit, then you can let the, the, the underlying graph get large. How are we doing on time? Okay, <laughs> this is my last slide. So we can change the tile, right? This is, I can do the same game in, in great generality. Here's another tile, square tile, gives you kind of a similar behavior. The, if my tile is a plus polyamino, you know, you could just do the, the analysis. It's just extracting Fourier coefficients of some rational function. You get some beautiful and mysterious pattern of covariances. Uh, and the, here's, here's even an example of a polyomino which gives some quasi-periodic, in the epsilon goes to zero limit, uh, covariance function. It's a quasi-crystal sort of naturally occurring Quasi-crystal, so the, the has long-range correlations, but non-periodic. Non so, uh, you know that it is non-periodic. Uh, th there's a formula, very similar to the one over here, with a different denominator, yeah. and the roots in of the denominator are not rational, don't have rational arguments. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what these. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, so the covariance is is given by this log one over epsilon times this cosine function where the theta naught and phi naught are not uh, rational arguments. Okay, that's all I have to say. Oh, well, there was some conformal invariance business, but I ran out of time, so I will not tell you. So a quick question or two. Yeah. In the first part, when you spoke about the Ising model, I suppose the, the transition is is mean field is classical or not? From the the fact that you maximize. Yes. 
kind of like a mean field, except that it's occurring at a non, you know, the at the leading eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix, which is not kind of a mean field uh, thing. No, but that sure, yeah, yeah. But it's ex your formula was one over L logarithm Z was exact somehow. So, and it was not not mean field. It looked the right hand side looked like mean field, but left hand side is not mean field. Okay, <laughs> I don't know exactly what the uh, formula you're referring. When to. you write to, when you wrote the formula at the beginning, where you replace this, you know, where you introduce this n. Yes. Yeah, and this a lot of copies. And then you were saying that here is partition function of the original model. And you know, you replaced partition function by maximum of something. Well, that's because the large chain. That's me. Okay. On the left hand side where you have this arrow. Yeah. It was yeah. A, it was a maximum chain. Right. I don't know if that corresponds to me, that means it's mean no, field or not. I'm not sure that terminology even applies in this situation. I think it would be mean field if you have inter for one vertex, if you'd have arrow edges between the, the ones above one single vertex. <coughs> the difference comes from the fact that you have alpha. U sure, alpha there is no complete graph. It's you know bipartite, but somehow the right hand side, the yeah, figures he is showing later, are. Uh, Looking like an inferior. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's a question of definition. Yes. Yes. Did you compute the critical exponents or, or not? Uh, say for the susceptibility. Because there's uh, some similarity with the large n limit, right? Where you also have a Gaussian, Gaussian critical point, but non mean field critical exponent, mm -hmm. say three dimensions uh, or two. Yeah, I didn't do that yet. That's worth That's That's worth it. <coughs> yeah. Okay. I think a certain confusion is generated because n multiplies here in terms of two types. So to put this and what Griffiths does on the same footing, you may want to separate the weight of the factors between the two sums in the exponent here. What Griffiths did was essentially allow, well, allow the on-site coupling also, but that's a, yeah, put n one here. And N1 and N2. And there is some, so give some other scaling. So the idea of Griffiths was that you can generate an arbitrary single sin, spin distribution from on-site coupled easing models. And take your favorite symmetric distribution function, you pretty much can generate oh, this. And then yeah. the coupling between those can be adjusted with another scale, scaling, independently scaled version. In the scaling you chose, I think you are driven towards a, a ground state of something in a finite for a finite <coughs> graph. Yeah, sure. That's what this that's what yeah. we're saying right. here. Right. Yeah. right. So if you if you allow yourself separate scaling for the second part, you can also generate Gibbs measures of this finite graph. And then you can talk about the infinite volume limit and three dimensional Yeah, it's not clear that I, I could do anything in that setting. Sorry? I'm not sure I can do any sort of calculation there though. But okay. Is no? the Simon Gris so, class? Simon Griffiths. Simon Griffiths. Oh, yes. Yes. So Simon Griffiths wanted to do something with their construction. They wanted to show that by the fourth theory has, for example, the Liang property. What did you want to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, it was really not quite clear to me. I think so. The idea is behind that. The, the idea is that, that this, uh, it's a long story how we came about this uh, model. But the idea is that uh, it, it's this idea in that box. You know, the goal of lots of combinatorics is to compute the partition function. And this is a case where the partition function really becomes just a calculus problem, right? That was our goal. Uh, it happened to be an easy calculus problem in this case. Uh, well, I mean, in some cases it's easy, in some cases still difficult. For the tiling case. For the tonic case, it's it leads to some interesting stuff. Even for the Ising model, it leads to some interesting stuff in the in the you know low temperature region. region. We're not asking sophisticated physics questions yet, because it was just a, we're just a, getting started on this model. So I'm happy to have suggestions about what we should do now. Uh, does that answer your question? Kind of, probably. <laughs> <laughs>
So I think it's been said uh, several times this week, but I think it's uh, there's no harm in saying it again that this is was a wonderful opportunity to celebrate a uh, hundred years more or less of uh, the easing model. And I think we should thank the organizers and all the speakers and all of the ones who participated in this uh, meeting. Thank you.